There is joy in the house of the Lord, yes? Memorial Day weekend. We set aside a day to be grateful for those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we can live in peace. And uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, I like having holidays and I like travel and I like picnics and, you know, all the stuff. But Memorial Day is a lot more than an excuse to put lawn furniture on sale. So uh, let us remember Memorial Day, what that's really about this weekend, and uh, set some time aside to sort of be quiet and just be grateful for the life that we have and those who made that possible. Uh, Memorial Day, as I was thinking about Memorial Day, it's important to remember the people who have sacrificed so that we can have life. But I also thought about it a little bit. Memorial Day is kind of like, if it weren't for the gospel, even Memorial Day would just be a really sad occasion. Right? But because of the grace of Jesus Christ, (laughs) you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But because of Jesus... We even can celebrate things like people who sacrificed and gave their lives for us because we know that Jesus has made eternal life possible. There is hope. And so we don't mourn like people who have no hope. We can think of people, maybe we've never met people in our history who gave up their lives so that we can have the life that we have, we may just be able to thank them in person. You know how amazing that is? Because of Jesus, because of the gospel, there's a distinct possibility that we can actually personally thank people for their sacrifices for us. And all kinds of sacrifices. People have sacrificed their lives throughout human history so that we can have the life that we have. And so, Memorial Day is a celebration, yes, of the life that we have and how it came to be. It's also a celebration of the gospel, because we're able to celebrate those lives. Those lives were not spent in vain. Those lives did not end, because Jesus gave us the promise of eternity. Isn't that amazing? I think that's really incredible. I went to a memorial service on Friday... Uh, too complicated, so we'll just say distant cousin, and you'll just uh, go with me on that. Distant cousin. I hadn't seen her in a really long time. Uh, but anyway, my, uh, my mom and I went to her memorial service, and honestly, friends, it was striking. I've, I've conducted a number of memorial services and funerals, and I've been around them for a long time, but I don't think I've ever seen one that was this obvious who knew the gospel and who didn't know the gospel. It was sad in its own way because the Roughly speaking, the closer the relatives were to the deceased, the less it seemed they knew the gospel. And um, there's no certainty about the deceased as far as her attitude about the gospel. I don't know. Uh, Her immediate family, her siblings didn't seem to know her position with the gospel. She passed away suddenly and young, uh, just to give you a little bit of background. But she had children there who are in their 20s, young families, and they mourned. It was sad, all right? It's a funeral. I get that. It's a memorial service. There's a level, you know, we grieve when people we love are no longer with us. I, I get that, okay? So I'm, I'm not minimizing that, And please don't hear me judging my relatives. But there were people there who were mourning 
like people who had no hope. They were in despair. Clearly, they were in despair. And there were people there who were sad, but were mourning with hope. And the difference is, as I said, we don't know where she was with what her relationship with Jesus was. But people who know the gospel, even in that sort of ambiguity, there's still hope, right? <laughs> there's still, we at least have the hope that she knows Jesus, or that she came to know Jesus, or there was some private meandering with Jesus. You know, there's, there's always this, when we know the gospel, there's this glimmer of hope. If you don't know the gospel, when life ends, that's all there is. And so in that, this memorial service was really sad because there were people who were mourning the loss of their loved one with, oh, with no hope. And it was, it was hard. It was a hard place to be. So like I said, I went with my mother. We took her car because her car is easier to get into than mine. And uh, her car also, my car had been sitting in the parking lot all day, and her car had been running with the air conditioner on. So it seemed like the obvious choice to take her car. And, you know, trying to lighten the mood a little bit, um, she had a bunch of these in the car. And she said, you want, you want this? And she gave me this flashlight. And um, I like flashlights. Flashlights are fun. I'll try not to shine it in your face. Um, it occurred to me when she gave me this flashlight on the way home from this really heavy service why we were there. We were there to shine a light in the dark places. That's our job as Christians. People who know the gospel, people who love Jesus and have hope, our job is to shine the light in the dark places. So, I'm going to, I mean, I like flashlights and all, but this one's kind of special. I'm going to keep this one close by. Because, <laughs> you know, it was, I think the Lord spoke to me in that moment. The world, unaware of Jesus, is a dark place. Do you know this? Do you see this? You don't have to look hard to find it. And we can look at the world that we live in and think, wow, this is, it's just so bad, and it's getting so bad. Friends, the world, unaware of Jesus, has always been a really dark place. That's not new. Ever since the fall in the garden... There has, darkness has ruled the world as we know it. And God has a plan to deal with the despair and the darkness in the world. You know what that plan is? Us. The people who have accepted the incredible gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and also who have accepted his amazing invitation to shine the light into the dark places. Those two things are synonymous. If you have accepted the grace of Jesus Christ for eternal life, for forgiveness of your sins, hallelujah, and this is a great idea, I strongly recommend it. If you have accepted that, then you have accepted the invitation to shine his light into the dark places. The two things come as a package. And it would be so, it would be so much more fun if we could just bask in the light of Jesus, wouldn't it? It'd be so nice. Like, me and Jesus, we're tight, and that's all we need. Well, in the manner of speaking, for your salvation, that's true. But Jesus had a better plan. We've been studying, as you know, we've been working through the book of Ephesians. Uh, today we're going to start in chapter 4. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, just as a reminder from where we got started, when Paul wrote this, he was in prison. All right? When Paul was in prison, his life was coming to an end. 
He knew that. His time was running short. And he knew, therefore, that since his time was running short, if he had something to say, he better get it said. So he wrote to the church in Ephesus, and it is a f many people's favorite book because, well, for a lot of reasons. But one, there's not a lot of fluff in Ephesians. <laughs> He's like, here, 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 here. There's not a whole lot of redundancy. There's not a whole lot of extra. It's just, boom, this is what you need to know. You need to know this. Pay attention to this. It's almost like bullet points. And when it does get redundant, then you know he's really serious. Because he didn't waste a lot of words in this point in his life. So this is this letter that he has written. And he wrote specifically about people of Christ, the people of the light living in the dark world. This is what he said, chapter 4 of Ephesians, starting in verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so, that, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Does that sound like anything maybe you see going on around you today? See what I mean? Things haven't changed all that much. When he talks about the Gentiles here, when he says Gentiles, he's meaning anyone at this point who is not, who has not accepted Jesus. Anybody who is not, uh, anybody who lives apart from God, right? It's a pretty broad term. And he's thinking their thinking is futile because it's disconnected from the truth. It's disconnected from the purpose that comes from knowing the Lord. Paul describes their condition. He says they are darkened in their understanding. This, this picture of darkened, it's an odd word to think about people, but it is a good demonstration. You could use the word blinded. The implication of that word is that there's an inability to see what is plainly apparent. That's the Greek word, is, that's what it means. It's, it's so darkened is the shortest way to say it in English, but the Greek word is actually much deeper than that. It's, it's not blind in that they can't see anything. They just can't see what is plainly, evidently true in front of them because their has been twisted. Again, I ask you, does that sound like a world you know? He says, do not live that way. Do not live the way that your friends and neighbors live, disconnected from God. They are separated and ignorant, and their hearts, because of that, their hearts are hard. They have lost their sensitivity, and instead of following God and doing God's will, they indulge in impurity, and they're full of greed. Selfishness, making selfish choices, puts the lights out. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back around to that. When we only live for ourselves, we lose sight of the needs and the hurts of other people. We lose sight of the fact that other people have relevance to God and therefore to us. Even worse, when we try to put ourselves in the spotlight, when we try to shine light on ourselves, one thing, it doesn't work. We lose sight of everything else around us. Have you ever been in a really dark room? And taking a flashlight and just shined at it yourself, does that help you like find your way around? No. You stumble and fall all over everything. When you try to put yourself in the spotlight, nobody can see anything. Not only do you fail and you not get the spotlight you want, but also nobody else can see anything. Let's pick it up. Chapter 4, verse 20 of Ephesians. That, however, is not the way you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth 
that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Here, Paul shows us the stark contrast between the futility, the futile ways of Gentiles, the ways of the world and the way that they live compared to the way of Christ. He reminds these Ephesians that they learned this when they came to know Christ. Basically what he's saying is, okay, so everybody else lives a certain way. So what? Don't live like that. Jesus has given us a better way and you know it. You were taught it. When you became to know Jesus, you found the better way. Live in the better way. So they were supposed to renew their minds, to put on the new self, and to be created like God. Now, we, there's, we can only be so like God, right? When it says to, we're made like God, some people get hung up on that. They get a little bit too on that like God thing. There are actually faith groups who say if we do all the right things and check all the right boxes, we become gods ourselves. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying we will become like God in righteousness, which is a righteousness that only Jesus can give us. We can't do that for ourselves. This expression, put on and put off, put on the new self, put off the old self, that is language that most commonly is used with getting dressed. It has to do with your clothes. All right? Um, told you I went to this memorial service. It was graveside, outside, in a little cemetery. And beautiful little hilltop cemetery. Do you remember the weather Friday? It was everything Friday. We got it all on Friday. It rained pretty hard Friday morning, and then the sun came out. Isn't that just like May? You know what happens when the sun comes out after it's rained all morning in May? The humidity was to the moon. Do you know what that does to my hair? Thank you. I'm glad somebody chuckled at that. That's what my wife says all the time. Do you know what this is going to do to my hair? Right, okay. The humidity was through the moon, all right? So by the time it was time for this service, which was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> the sun would be out for a few minutes, and then a big cloud would roll over, and then it would drip a little bit. It never really rained. It just drizzled. And that would pass, and the sun would come back out. And then, you, you follow what I'm saying? When the sun was out, it was straight up hot standing out in this field. Right? And they had the tent, you know, the little tent. And they had the chairs with the carpet draped over them that everybody's so comfortable on. Right? That you sit down and they sink and they, yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, sometimes you just have to find a levity in situations, Right? So there's this little tent, and we're out there, and it's a dark color. So when the sun beats down on it, under the tent gets like super, super hot. But I wasn't under the tent. I was standing near the tent. So the sun was actually shining on me, and then the clouds would come over, and there'd be a little bit of a breeze, and then it would drip and get this little drivel thing. And this happened. This, we went through these cycles a couple of times. All right, now I'm wearing a white shirt and a tie. Are you getting an image of how this day's going for me? Here's my point. When the service was over, when I got, well, I had to take my mom home and all that, but when I got home, I put off those clothes as fast as possible. <laughs> I understand this concept of cast off the old self. All right, that tie and that shirt probably ought to be burned, but I think I'll try to wash them first. They were wet. Do I need to keep talking? 
My wife says, no, you follow where we're going. Like, I understand what he's saying here, this put off. That is the image we're supposed to have. We're supposed to be disgusted by our old way of life. That's what Paul is telling us. The life that the Gentiles are living right now, there's a couple things he's telling us. Don't forget, that was your life. You don't judge people who live that way. You show them the better way by putting off those clothes. Take off that old self and put on the new self in righteousness that was made possible by the death of Jesus Christ through the gospel. That language is striking to me, all right? This picture is really strong, right? We're supposed to take the old, sticky, stinky, self-centered, former way of life and get it gone because it separates us from God. Take that off and put on a new identity that is given to us in holiness and righteousness. And this is not, don't get confused by this picture because it's not a one-time thing. You don't do it once and you're done. Okay, this is a daily thing. In fact, some days, this is a minute-by-minute minute thing. Where you suddenly recognize, oh, wait a minute, I'm behaving in my old way of life. And I took that off. That's what he's talking about. It's not a once-and-done transfer transformation. It's a way of living, being transformed. It's a host of conscious decisions to live in truth and righteousness only made possible through Christ. And we do it day by day, minute by minute, all the time. How is it that we do that? Well, he gives us a little more information in verse 25, chapter 4, Ephesians, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. You see what he just gave us right there? This is prescriptive. So many things in the Bible are these great ideas. This wonderful ideology. This is what you should do. You should live this way. You should live this way. So often, we don't have specific instructions. These are very specific instructions and they're very good they're practical instructions for how we should live think of it this way we have defenses in place to protect us from the influences of the world paul influ paul first emphasizes truthfulness that's our part from the inside out deception has no place in the body of christ we must be people of integrity speaking the truth in love that's an entire expression Speaking the truth in love. I know way too many people who really enjoy speaking the truth without love. Those people are called bullies. That's not what Jesus had in mind. It takes both. You also can speak in love without truth. Those people are deceivers. It takes both. Speak the truth in love. Always choose honesty, even when honesty is hard, even when honesty seems like it's really going to be hard. Saying the thing that's true is probably going to dig you a hole. That's what you're thinking in your mind. Let me help you. Lying digs you a bigger hole. Always. Just speak the truth. That's the one. Then he addresses anger. Everybody really likes this one, addressing anger in the Bible. Hmm. Hmm. He says, in your anger, do not sin. A lot of people get hung up on this. Anger is a natural emotion. Anger is a normal piece and part of our lives. It's part of what makes, it's part of the human experience. The trouble is keeping it under control. Anger reminds me a lot of fire. Fire actually can be really useful particularly this time of year when you want to make s'mores and roast your marshmallows, fire's great, right? But you have to keep it under control, right? Fire that's left to do its own thing, nothing good ever follows that. 
It has to be contained properly. It has to be processed. And ultimately, a fire has to be put out. Paul instructs us not to let the sun go down while we're still angry. It really doesn't have anything to do with the placement of the sun in the sky. His point is, don't hold on to your anger too long. It's okay to feel angry. What you do with your anger is the problem. In anger, do not sin. And that's what we're prone to do. Human beings, when we get angry, we say things. We say things we would never say if we weren't angry. Am I the only one here? I don't think so. Yeah. When we get angry, we go across the line. And it, it can lead us to sin. And he's saying, don't do that. Do you know what that means? You may not like what I'm about to say. That means that through Christ, we have the capacity to not sin in our anger. You can't say, well, they made me mad, so that's why I did it. That excuse doesn't work. First of all, nobody can make you mad. People can provoke you to anger. Nobody likes this. Anger is an emotion, but it's also a choice. Did he really just say that? Yeah. And it's a choice I've made way too many times the wrong way in my life. He says, in your anger, feel your anger, process your anger, and then put it away. Don't let it linger. Because if you do, it will take root in the form of bitterness. And I, friends, I have seen this so many times. And it is so sad. I know people who have been angry at somebody else for decades. And some of them don't even know why anymore. It's just become a way of life. They just hate this person. And they don't even know why. That is sin, friends. Holding on to that that long, that has become bitterness within your... You know what that eats? That eats at the person who clings to it. Not the person who supposedly is the subject of it. It eats the person who clings to it. He says, don't even let the sun go down on it. It needs to be resolved because otherwise it gives the devil a foothold. If you think of your soul, there's two, I want to give you two metaphors because it's kind of what I do. So forgive me. I think of like a castle or a stronghold or a refuge that you would go to to be safe, right? Right? In order to release your anger, you have to lower the bridge and open the doors. Okay? And sometimes there's a place for that. But if you've lowered the bridge and opened the doors, you have two risks here. One, you could let out something. You could say something that you might later want to bring back. And it's out at that point. Once you've said it, you can say you're sorry the rest of your life. It's out there. And the other thing is, if you leave the drawbridge down and the gates open, it leaves a place for the enemy to get in. Right? You're better off to just keep, keep it under control. Right? That's one image that came to my mind when I was thinking about that. That we, we need to learn to resolve conflict quickly. And if you cannot, there are situations in life that you just cannot resolve for one reason or another there are there are things that you just cannot come to agreement on in life and those things just learn to let it go just let it go which is really hard i'm not saying that's easy but again, if you cling to it, it's going to cause division, it's going to cause bitterness and heartache, 
And we have to learn, and honestly, what we have to do is ask God. Ask God to help us let this go. And live in a way that honors God. Manage our emotions in a way that honors God and maintains unity in the body of Christ. I have another metaphor for you. This one's a little more fun. Where my house is, where we live, actually the whole little town that we live in, apparently is a skunk sanctuary. Yeah, you agree? Skunks everywhere, all right? And they seem really happy living in my little town. There's skunks all over the place. And we have a dog. Can you see the problem? Right, we have a very friendly dog that likes to play. And we have skunks everywhere. This has the potential to be a real problem. I have discovered through some research that skunks prefer the dark. They're nocturnal. They prefer to be in the dark. So the way I have addressed this, I bought a whole bunch of light bulbs that just come on when it gets dark. Floodlights. You probably can see our house from weather satellites after dark. Because, I mean, it's like a, a runway at a major airport in my backyard. Everything's lit up everywhere, all around. You know what happens? The skunks stay in the woods. We see them, but we see them right along the edge of the woods, way back away from the house. And the lawn is all lit up. It also deters possums and groundhogs and ne'er-do-wells and all this, all this stuff. Just whew, You can see us. You can probably see us from here. Like that big glow in the sky, that's our house. They're LEDs, those of you who are earth conscious, relax, we're not like killing the world, but you know, they just come on automatically as long as we leave the light switches on, because the house wasn't wired for those, so you have to leave the switch on, and then when it gets dark, those lights come on, all over the place, okay? So, what I'm saying is, if you, if you give me this metaphor... We should live in a way that we just automatically shine the light. We don't think about it. We just do it. And the problem is, if we hold on to falsehood, if we speak falsely to one another, or if we hang on to anger, that turns the switch off. So when we get around the darkness, the light doesn't come on. You see the problem? We have, to, we have to ask God, and it can be really, really hard. We have to ask God to let these things go. And the fact that it is written in the Bible that we're supposed to do it tells us it's possible. It can be done by the grace of God. We have to make sure that we don't do anything to hinder the light. Right? And don't allow these things to linger. Now, we're going to jump forward a little bit into chapter 5. And I know what you're thinking, Pastor, you can't do that. You can't skip chapters in one sermon. And I'm going to remind you, the chapters and verses were added later. This is all one letter. Okay? So, but don't worry. Relax. We're almost done. Um, <laughs> chapter 5. I think it's really important to what we're talking about. Chapter 5, starting in verse 8. It's a reminder. For you were once in darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. Do you see how that's written? It doesn't say now you are in the light. It says now you are light in the world. Ponder that a minute. That's not a weird translation. That's actually pretty accurate. He goes on to say, live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is, a shame, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, in secret. but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated 
becomes a light. Do you see what that says? It says the same thing twice in two different ways. Let me show you. It says in the first sentence, you are light in the Lord. And then down here he says everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Who's back there? Colin, would you do me a favor? Turn these lights off. Okay, now we would say it's dark relative to 10 seconds ago. But you know what? We can still see each other. Depending on where you're sitting in the room right now, you probably can still read. How is that possible if the lights are turned off? Well, here's the thing. The ultimate light source is beyond us. It's out there. But there are apertures in the walls that let that light out there come in. And that light, the ultimate light out there, is reflecting off of us. And because of that, we can see. It's reflecting off of the surfaces in the room. Okay? Are you getting where I'm going with this? We are not the light. God is the light. But in a world of darkness, people living in darkness can't see God, but they can see you, and they can see me. And what God is asking us to do, and this is true throughout all of the Bible, it's just really clear in this passage, to the world lost living in darkness, when they look at children of light, the people of light, they see light. Or at least they're supposed to. When the people living in the dark world look at the children of light, they're supposed to see the light of Jesus reflecting off of us. I use this expression a lot. You should have heard it by now. Like, this is, <laughs> this is what we are supposed to be. We're supposed to be reflectors of the light in the darkness so that we appear, as it says in Scripture, to be the light. Thank you, Colin. Would you mind turning the lights back on for me so I can read because I'm over 50 and you know how it is, all right? This is a metaphor. This metaphor is strong, all right? This idea that the ultimate power source is not us, but we reflect the light, right? The, the last thing I'm going to point out to you, and I promise this is it, chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. We, we read that, and we tend to get hung up on that last little piece, the days are evil. The days have always been evil. We look around, we read the news, we see the world, we see the way people act toward one another, the decisions people make, and we think it's just getting eviler and eviler. Yes, I just made that up. But really, it's been, it's been dark forever. Since the garden, it's been dark forever. That's not new. What we should be paying attention to is where he says, be careful how you live. Don't do anything that blocks the light. Be very careful. Through God's grace and mercy, empowered by the Holy Spirit, thankful to Jesus Christ, Live in such a way that you do not obscure the light. That's what that says. Be very wise about it. Paul provided this blueprint for Christian living. Don't do anything to obscure the light. Abandon futile thinking. Put off your old way of life. Put on a new way of life. That little episode that I, we just did, that little experiment we did with the lights, would have been really different if I was wearing all black. Well, probably gray, right? I had to be a little bit thoughtful what I chose, you know. Take off the dark, put on the light. That doesn't mean you can't wear dark clothes. Relax. 
I'm just saying, metaphorically speaking, it works better if we stay in the light. Right? That's what he says. So this, this blueprint that Paul gives us is very simple and very doable. God said it. I believe it. Let's go. It's possible, so let's do it. New life in Christ is characterized by righteousness and holiness that only God can provide. And we're told to live truthfully and process our emotions correctly. In other words, ultimately, we have to give our emotions to the Lord. It's okay to become angry. People do mean things. Bad things happen. It's okay to be sad when sad things happen. We have to process our emotions in Christ. In other words, give our emotions to Him. We don't grieve like people who have no hope. We also don't get angry like people who have no hope. Did he just say that? Mm, yeah. Yes, he did. We're supposed to live differently than we lived before we had hope. I hope you understand this whole thing is supposed to be encouraging. Do you feel encouraged? It's supposed to be an encouraging message today. Paul was in prison. Life was dark for Paul. And he was giving them this message of light. Strong, clear message of light. Of how they were to live. It was to a specific group of people in a specific moment in time. But the truth in it still applies to us today. I'm absolutely convinced. He calls us to do the same things. He calls us to live on purpose in the same way he called the Ephesian church to live on purpose. Friends, you may be the only light the world around you sees. There are places you go and things that you do where you may be the only reflector of God's light that there is in that environment. God puts you there on purpose, for this purpose. You know that the light of God reflects off of you. They don't. In dark places, people who are in, who are in dark places, living in the futility that the Gentiles did, as he reminded them, in the same futility that we did, People who are still living there, they don't recognize that the light is from God. They see light from you, which is the beginning to open a conversation because at least they see the light if they see the light in you. So friends, the world, I don't know if you've noticed this, the world needs light. The people around you need light. Your neighbors, the people across the street, the people on the other side of the gas pump, the waiters and the waitresses, the people where you work. People need the light. We need to be reflectors of that light. Amen? I'm going to ask the usher to prepare for uh, the receiving of our tithes and our offerings today. Generosity, just think about generosity in, the, in place of aligned with this whole idea of living in the light. We didn't do anything to deserve God's grace. That's what grace is. God gave it to us freely. And he wants us to use it. He wants us to reflect him to the world. Our generosity, our tithes and our offerings and our being generous with people around us, these are a really good way, one of or few ways really, that we can really give a gift back to God. It's a way that we can reflect our gratitude for His generosity, for giving us the light, for showing us to not live in the darkness. All right? So when we are generous and we share with people who have needs, we're actually doing God's will. We're actually allowing God to use us to accomplish His purposes. That is one way that we reflect His light. Simply doing what He said. So I'm going to have 
Nathan, come forward, and he will receive your gifts as you like. I know a lot of people give online, livingstonenas.org. Um, and then once the, the offering plate has, once the reception is done, or, or even before, we can stand and sing along with the worship team. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this beautiful place where you have planted us. We thank you that you inspire generations before us with a vision of the life that could be and that was worthy of sacrificing for. Lord, we thank you for those who have sacrificed for us throughout generations so that we could be here and worship you freely without fear. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these tithes and these offerings these gifts that we give as a reflection back to you. And we pray that you will give wisdom on how to best invest them to grow your kingdom to your glory and your honor so that you will be known here and beyond. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.